Mm. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So last week, in the first installment of this new series, we asked a very serious question. Uh, what does it mean to have a biblical faith, a, a biblical faith? Does it mean that uh, you take the words of Scripture to be the literal, inerrant Word of God without any errors whatsoever um, that stand for all time in this changing world? Well, if that's the definition of having a biblical faith, we found last week, looking at the story of Peter and his uh, vision, uh, that Peter would be about the last person we could point to as having a biblical faith. Sometimes it's better if we're going to ask ourselves what is a biblical faith all about rather than just simply kind of coming up with our own idea of what it means to have a biblical faith to actually look at the Bible and ask, well, how do the people in the Bible have a, a, a biblical faith? And drawing on Peter as an example, um, we would have to conclude that part of what it means to have a biblical faith is that uh, the, one of the first principles would be that the Holy Spirit trumps Scripture. It trumps the Bible. We we saw that in in Peter's uh, vision in in Acts uh, 10 and 11. Basically, uh, if if the Holy Spirit tells you to eat food that has been clearly forbidden in Scripture as an abomination to eat, um, you start up the barbecue because it's the Holy Spirit who told you that, and that trumps Scripture. Conversely, if the Holy Spirit tells you to associate yourself and, and invite into your community of faith people for whom the Bible clearly forbids you to do, You open your door wide in your faith community. Why? Because the Holy Spirit tells you to, and the Holy Spirit trumps Scripture. Now, some of you are probably cheering about now. It's like, finally, we can get out from under all these rules and regulations and go with the Spirit. And if if you are uh, uh, cheering, uh, I suggest you you have reason to be concerned uh, by that principle. And if you are worrying about that principle, I would suggest you also have some reason for, for comfort. But uh, in terms of the concern level, I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is a difficult uh, thing to get our, our minds and hearts around. You know, it seems that you know, if the Holy Spirit could be equated with the, 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 the voice or the, or the spirit of the living Christ, the Christ's continuing presence in our day, um, you know, listening for it is kind of difficult. Even Christ said, you know, we know where it comes. We, you know, we can sense it's coming, but we don't know where it comes from or where it goes. You can't predict any of these things. Sometimes it gets a little bit, you know, f- you know we spent, what, six weeks last fall just asking that one question, how do we tell whether it's the Holy Spirit speaking or the pizza I just ate? I mean, we are, you know, we are governed by all kinds of impulses and all kinds of voices in our heads. And, and, and so sometimes we may think we've heard from the Spirit, uh, but maybe it has been the pizza or our own ego or our own hysteria. And so it actually, you know, we, we spent six weeks. We could have spent six months on that topic. And really, you can spend easily six years just refining what it means to follow the Spirit. Yet in our fast food world, you know, we, we want a mc, mc, interpretation, <laughs> interpretation. You know, we want to grab it, we, we just want to grab something off the shelf and say, here's, this is what applies in our changing world. We don't want to put in the time and effort it takes to actually try uh, to listen for that spirit. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but more than just having techniques, um, listening for the spirit takes a greater degree of surrender than we often want to give it. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is talking to you and I all the time, no less so than it was ever in the Bible itself. Uh, but how much we actually take it in depends on the level of our surrender. I mean, if it's truly coming from God, um, God knows a lot more about how to make us thrive in the world than we do, and so we kind of go along on our expectations, and when we hear, when we sense something that tends to click life in place, or we get that aha moment that just something feels right and good, oftentimes we don't trust it. We think it's too good to be true. Or we, we think that, that the source from which it comes believes in us more than we believe in ourselves, and we're not ready to believe in ourselves to that level. We think, oh, I could never accomplish this. I could never go in that direction. I'm simply not capable. You know, so we, we kind of think we're gonna, that God wants to do this, us to this alone, yet God is actually counting on being there with us to do these things. You look at every single experience of a prophet's call in the Bible. 
whether it be uh, Moses or Ezekiel or, 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 or Isaiah, um, or even the disciples called in, in, in the Gospels, when the voice of God comes to them, their instant reaction is not, oh, great, this is wonderful, God spoke to me. It's like, to, to take the words of Isaiah, woe is to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I mean, we resist at first. Because that ripple effect, you know, it's like God just throws down into a still pond of the world this giant stone, and the ripples of that love and grace just keep reverberating. And yet, when we're on the surface of that water, it just feels more like a tidal wave at times, just overturning our expectations. We resist. Um, but sometimes, quite frankly, I myself feel that, 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 that draw to just have a quick fix. You're like, can I just get a word from the Lord and, and, and you know, pull it from Scripture and just apply it to my life you know, in just some way that I don't have to think about too much? Because this other stuff is so subjective, and I always ask, worry, did I get it right or did I not? And did you get it right or did you not? And there's all kinds of people who claim really crazy stuff that they say God spoke to them too. And, you know, I don't want to be one of those people and so forth. Um, it, it's difficult. Well, let's just as a for instance, um, imagine if we were to uh, take that off-the-shelf approach and say everything in Scripture is the literal, inerrant Word of God, how would our lives need to change um, if that were uh, the case? Let's just simply pull, oh, some random Scriptures, like, oh, yeah, how about Leviticus 18 <laughs> and 20? From the land, random scripture of Leviticus, <laughs> chapters 18 and 20. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Keep my statutes and observe them. I am the Lord. I sanctify you. All who curse father or mother shall be put to death. Having cursed father or mother, their blood is upon them. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor... Both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes a wife and her mother also, it is depravity. They shall be burned to death, both he and they, that there may be no depravity among you. If a man has sexual relations with an animal, he shall be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and has sexual relations with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall be subject to punishment. If a man lies with a woman having her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, he has laid bare her flow, and she has laid bare her flow of blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. Clear, black and white word from Scripture. Lots of advice about um, our, our lives today. Probably what jumped out at, at, at many are uh, those verses that we hear all the time now cited uh, by, uh, uh, by preachers and we'll be dealing with at, at, at Darkwood Brew tonight, the ones that involve uh, uh, gay and lesbian folks. So you, you heard the, the, the first uh, verse. And we're going to deal with that Darkwood Brew. We're not going to deal with that this morning. But just to give you an example, an idea of what we'll be talking about tonight is is that verse, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And uh, many people say, well, see, the Bible said it, I believe it, um, and that settles it. But what oftentimes people don't um, uh, acknowledge is the fact that in chapter 20, it also says they shall be put to death. The last 15 years I've been talking about uh, uh, equality for 
gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. And quite frankly, I'm really, really, really weary of having to defend uh, uh, people we know and love um, in relation to the, these, these passages uh, here. It's, it's quite wearisome. And I say that as a straight person. I can't even imagine what it must be like to be gay and to be here the cited from the heart of the faith community and especially to hear a call for the death penalty is, 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 alongside a claim, this is the literal, inerrant word of God. Well, you know, at least you know, with, with you, many of us uh, either are related or to a gay person or know gay people who are, have been the greatest, most loving, morally, ethically upstanding people who've never harmed us in any way. Well, I would suggest instead of dealing with, with this subject this morning, uh, we put somebody else on the hot seat. Um, you know, there are some of the people who were cited in the scripture um, were harming. Uh, I like, I'd like to uh, focus this morning, actually, on those rebellious teenagers. Do you hear that, that, that verse? Uh, All who curse father or mother shall be put to death. Having cursed father or mother, uh, their blood is upon them. Now, there's something we can get behind, huh? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. There's a father. Is, yeah. So... <laughs> so um, uh, huh? He's also a son. He's also a son. This is true. Yeah, it's amazing. You didn't get put to death long ago. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there's something uh, uh, for us to, to talk about. Um, yeah, what about those? I mean, at least in every circle, single circumstance, they've actually created a fence that has, has, has sinned against us. So we can at least maybe uh, affirm that. And you know, as a father, I actually, I'm always you know, concerned. You know, I've got two unmarried daughters. I, you know, I don't want to even think about them having premarital sex. And so um, I'm also going to you know, maybe put this up in their bedroom. Um, you know. <laughs> If evidence of the young woman's virginity was not found, that is, in the, uh, when they were married, uh, then they shall bring the young woman out to the entrance of her father's house, and the men of her town shall stone her to death. Now, some of you um, young unmarried women are probably getting a little bit nervous at this point where the sermon is going to go. I will tell you, there is a way you can have premarital sex and still uh, live, and we'll give, you may not exactly... Um, make this maybe feel as comfortable, but if a man meets a virgin who is not engaged and seizes her and lies with her, i.e. rapes her, and they, sh uh, and they are caught in the act, the man who lay with her shall give 50 shekels of silver to the young man's father, and she shall become his wife. Because he violated her, he shall not be permitted to divorce her as long as he lives. the literal, inerrant word of God. Rita talked about how you know, the world changes. You know, God created this world, and the, just the natural way the world works is actually to change. And oftentimes, you know, the change is, 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 you know, causes anxiety. We think that, the, well, the way the God is different from the world is God creates something that never changes, you know, that, the, that, that the flow of the world goes, but you can always count on it being there. But life is more like a stream, you know, and, and the flow is more like that stream. If, if something is way back here, um, it's not going to help you if you're way downstream. Where the Word of God really comes to us is something that's, that's continuously in that stream. So no matter where you enter that stream, it is there for you. you know, about 200 members of our congregation are part of the medical community. You get this probably quicker than anybody else. If you, can make, you can imagine if you're a surgeon saying, okay, well, you know, God is involved in healing the body, so if we're going to be godly. We're, gonna, we're going to take what is reveal, was revealed to surgeons in 1000 BC and use those same techniques today. You know, so we're going to go into surgery. I've got a really nice, sharp stone I've hewn for you. you know, you're going to do that, right? No. You know, those techniques have to change over time. And of course, as we experiment with medicine, we make mistakes at time too, right? We try new techniques and we realize, oh, that wasn't such a good idea. You know, sorry about that arm. <laughs> you know, but, but, in, but we, still ha we are compelled to do that because the, the, healing, med the healing arts continue to change and our awareness of these change, and so we change over time. That's the way God works too. <clears throat> Now, if you think I was just kind of setting you up because this is all Old Testament stuff, um, you know, uh, maybe we ought to t turn to something that's, you know, and, and, and peg it into history from the New Testament, see if that stands for, for all time. Let's take, you know, putting others on the hot seat, let's take the issue of, of, of divorce. That, you know, that, 
divorce is also a subject um, in the Bible, and some of you have experienced that uh, personally. What does Jesus you know, in the New Testament say about divorce? Well, in uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus has some pretty clear words to say about divorce. He says the following. He says, uh, Jesus said to them, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one, one flesh. So they will no longer, are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Um, Jesus said, you know, they're together now, no, no separating. Interestingly enough, this is a, a verse that's frequently cited with respect to these contemporary debates about homosexuality. And yet, it's, Jesus isn't talking about homosexuality here. He's talking about don't get divorced. Why don't preachers ever talk about that? <laughs> you know, right? Um, so how does this function as God's word for us today? You know, if we're going to just say, take that... that that statement, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, it gets rather dicey. More about divorce later. Let's just take a look at some of the ways our lives would have to change if God said it means it says it in the Bible. The Bible clearly forbids, for instance, mixing two kinds of cloth. If you are wearing clothing today that is made out of anything but pure wool or pure cotton, please take off your clothes right now. It's an abomination to wear them. <laughs> Just kidding, really. No, 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 no. Please don't. Please don't take off your clothes. <laughs> if you uh, ate Czech cereal this morning, um, that was an abomination because it mixed two different kinds of grain. Uh, if you married outside the faith, that is not uh, allowed either. If you have been divorced and have remarried, that's also uh, forbidden in the Bible. Uh, having sex at the time of a woman's menstrual period, that is also uh, forbidden. In fact, uh, that couple is to be forever banished from the community if they, if they do that. Crossbreeding of animals is forbidden. As we learned last week, so does you know, eating pork, shellfish. Uh, cheeseburgers are also, don't know, going to McDonald's after worship, that's uh, forbidden. Um, in Nebraska, us corn huskers um, might have a particular problem with this last one here. Uh, touching the skin of a pig is considered an abomination as well. I, I, I've, I've never seen them holding up signs saying, abomination at a huskers game. Uh, uh, now, lest you think I'm being sanctimonious, let's shine, shine light on us clergy. You are not allowed to join the clergy if you trim your sideburn or uh, beard. You are not allowed to be clergy if you've married a non-virgin, widow, or divorcee. You're not allowed to be clergy if you have a limb that's too long or too short. I like this next one, too thin or too small, um, or have defective eyesight, <laughs> or are hunchbacked, have skin disease, or my personal favorite, have damaged testicles. I can guarantee you no one ever asked me about these things on my ordination exams. Yeah. Uh, even more surprising, they never even asked me if I had ever been a banker or have had any money in an interest-bearing bank account. Can you even believe it? Oh, you know what the Bible says about bearing interest on loans, uh, don't you? Oh, my gosh. I mean, if you want to have you know, something that, that it keeps being repeated in Scripture, uh, far more than these things about males laying with males or what have you, it's charging interest on loans. There are so many. Uh, I, mean, I can't even put them all up on the, the, the screen. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me that we don't have teams of Christians standing outside of every bank with signs, God hates loan officers. I mean, you think I'm kidding. I mean, look at, look, you just as an example, Exodus. If you lend many money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Ezekiel puts a little finer point on the matter. He equates people who charge interest on loans, he lumps them in with murderers, adulterers, idolaters, and robbers. He says, in fact, uh, if he has exacted usury, that is taking money and interest, or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood is upon him.
God said it. I believe it. Does that settle it? It's amazing how people pick and choose what is God's clear word in Scripture, is it not? You know, picking out some passages, making these huge high horse stands, and completely ignoring all kinds of other passages that by, the same, by their same logic should be applying just as readily. You know, uh, you know, bottom line, the Bible prohibits all kinds of things that even the most conservative, Bible-believing Christian would never prohibit. But so likewise, the Bible permits things that even the most conservative among us would never uh, permit as well. You know, for instance, um, such things as uh, polygamy, uh, slavery, male domination of women. Well, that still is kind of popular in some quarters, but we're treating women like property. Um, no, we're actually more conservative uh, than, the, than the Scriptures are on, on these levels. No, bottom line, every person, no matter how um, you know, Bible-believing they are, they have a canon within a canon. That is to say, there are certain Scriptures that matter more than others, that, that are more authoritative than others, that are more reflective of God's Word uh, than other uh, Scriptures are. Every single person has this, even if they deny it till they are blue in the face even if they swear that every line of Scripture is the literal, inerrant Word of God, they still have a canon within the canon. And this is not a problem. This was not seen as a problem for the first 1,700 years of Christianity. This is exactly what Christians had, was canon within a canon. <clears throat> Christians were smart enough back then, we seem to have lost the wisdom in modern times, to know that the world does change and that God keeps speaking to the world. And so we keep learning new insights about what it means to be in relationship with, a, with this God and needing to adjust accordingly to that God who is in the flow of history with us. And so as we go, there are certain things in the canon that no longer make sense and other things that didn't make sense before that make perfect sense uh, now. The problem, the only problem with having a canon within a canon is if you deny that you have it. Because if you deny that you have it and you still have one, there is no basis by which you can be judged about, well, how are you picking and choosing? What is your basis for picking? It's just whatever your ego or your hysteria tends to pick. You pick and you say, oh, I'm not doing that. But if you acknowledge that you have a canon within a canon, then somebody might logically ask, well, by what basis do you take this scripture and say that's no longer the word of God, and you take this scripture and say this is? Now we have a rational conversation and one that is quite meaningful. Now, scholars have you know, been aware of this for you know, eons, and they, t they characterize this, this kind of this dance we do with Scripture as, as uh, the, the coherent versus, judging the coherent versus the contingent. That means that Scripture has, um, you know, we have over a thousand years of literature in the Bible. Over a thousand years, all kinds of time periods, all kinds of different ideas about, uh, you know, about life and our relationship with God, about medicine, about all those things in there. And, um, and, and yet, if you look at the whole sweep of Scripture, you can find certain themes that seem to come up time and time again and be relatively unchanged, uh, you know, regardless of historical or cultural context. Those are the coherent, those deep threads that just kind of, no matter where you enter the stream, they seem to track you wherever you are. Conversely, there are these contingencies that, that, that seem to appear like at this point in the stream, but then they, they seem to be wiped out by history. They don't appear again, or they appear only very rarely. They don't seem to be a major theme in the Bible. As a, as a concrete example, we could look at, too, simply those law codes that are in the Old Testament. You know, there, in the Old Testament, there are three major law codes uh, there are, there's the holiness code, which we heard from in Leviticus. There's the covenant code in Exodus. And then we also heard a little bit about our rebellious teens uh, having sex. Um, in the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomic code, um, there are three great law codes. And each of these three uh, uh, seem to be attempts at three different parts of Israel's history to ask the question, how do we live by the Ten Commandments in our day? How do we apply these in real, concrete terms in, in our day? Now, interesting that there's three, right? I mean, why wouldn't there just be one? Here's how you do it. But the presence of three of these codes means that at least in one point of Israel's history, they looked back and said, you know what? These 
Rules and regulations are no longer speaking to us. We need to come up with a whole other set. And then in another part of Israel's history, they looked back and said, you know what? These two law codes are no longer speaking to us. We need to create another one. And so they do, and, and each of the law codes have certain similarities and all kinds of differences of emphasis and contradictions among them. So what's the coherence and the contingence? The coherence, of course, is the Ten Commandments themselves. You know, every point in their history, they affirm that these Ten Commandments are good and logical things to, to live by. Uh, in the New Testament, they are affirmed as well. The contingencies are the particular laws and regulations that, are caught, you know, that they have come up with at different points to interpret uh, those uh, very uh, commandments. So how does this apply to our day? Yeah. Well, we have a great example, bringing back that, uh, the, the divorce Example. We have a great example of this operating in the New Testament um, with Paul. You, we remember what Jesus said about uh, divorce. It's like, ah, don't, you don't do it. Well, what does Paul say? The, the question comes up in the Corinthian community about divorce. Let's hear what Paul says about the matter. From the first letter to the community in Corinth. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does separate, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I and not the Lord, that if any, believe, any believer has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound. It is to peace that God has called you. You hear the curiosity in that, in that scripture? He, you know, he notes, you know, okay, we know what Jesus said. Don't do it. Jesus, not me. Then he says, but I'm going to tell you, I am not Jesus. It's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is that even possible? Okay, he, Paul acknowledges that he knows what Jesus says about divorce. And now he's going to say, but I'm telling you, I am not Jesus. So I'm going to tell you something different. And what does he say? You know? So, you know, it's a, basically a good principle, stay married. Uh, but there, is, there are circumstances I can think of where maybe not. Like if you have somebody, you're to two totally different faith systems and you just are battling it together uh, all the time, uh, uh, you should probably uh, be separated from each other. And then he, he says, why does he say that? What, what was the basis by which then he's actually doing his own scripture within a canon, within a canon? He names the deeper coherence. He says, because it is to peace that God has called you. Paul is in touch with a very deep chord of coherence within the scriptural tradition. For Paul as a rabbi to say, to peace God has called you, it's not just simply as we would take it, as in the absence of violence or absence of conflict. Paul is a good rabbi. Peace to him uh, means uh, shalom. Shalom it can be literally translated peace, but it really is peace that is based upon well-being, wholeness, uh, prospering, uh, health, vitality. In other words, it's peace, the kind of peace that allows us to thrive in this life. And he knows that, that that need that God has, that desire that God has for us to thrive outweighs the different ways we try to achieve that. And so if you are locked in a marriage that is absolutely just causing um, each of the partners to be, you know, existing in this hell on earth, and, and there's, you've tried everything and there's no way to get out of that, there's just, you have never found that way, no matter how hard you pray and no matter how hard you work at it, uh, Paul says, hey, you know, there's a higher principle involved, you know. Uh, divorce is painful, but there are things that are more painful than that, you know, is, is, is being absent from that thriving that God wants for you. So he says... In those case, in that case, do so. The bottom line 
throughout the entire scriptural tradition, we can apply this, you know, this, this one form of coherence you know, in, in all kinds of situations. So you know, we can ask, well, why don't we stone rebellious teens anymore you know, <laughs> or, or teens who have premarital sex? Or why, uh, why, why don't we just forbid uh, divorce in all circumstances? Well, it's because there is more to it than that. You know, as we go, we enter the stream of life, and we understand more and more about how God uh, intends for us to thrive, we start to look back and say, is, does this mean, does this help a person thrive or not? You know, in their day, even some of these commands that seem so outrageous to us, was their attempt to also uh, figure out how to thrive. A lot of these, these commands had to do with the stability of the household and their, their best attempt at saying, well, here's how we can maintain the stability in the household. They also felt that we need to populate the earth like crazy, right? Because they're a very small population and, and there is no such thing as social security for adults. And so we want this to be, you know, lots of kids, lots of pro- propagation. So a lot of those commands had to do with simply making sure that people have lots of babies and are very skeptical about ways of living in the world that don't involve having babies, you know. And so in their particular time, some of these things you know, made a certain amount of sense. But we look back, we say, is this the way you thrive in the world today? Shalom. And so, you know, sometimes people you know, think, well, you know, why do we talk about you know, you know, homosexuality in the church these days? I mean, you know, we're behind it, we're fine, you know, whatever, we, we don't need to, we shouldn't bring it up anymore. You know, or, or why is this a concern? You know, uh, well... You know, maybe you can see now that we're all kind of bound up in this you know, together, that even if you know nobody who's gay, or, or uh, the, the very thing that, that says don't stone your child is the very thing that's linked to you know, welcome this gay person into our midst, that, that, that we're all wrapped up into this thing, this whole thing about life together. And that when we reach out and when we, when we test, when we, we, we follow that ripple, that next ripple in God's amazing revelation of love and grace, we, we actually um, heal ourselves, even if we have nothing to, to do with where God is taking that ripple to the next stage. It's all part of a whole cloth. And of course, at this table, um, this all really comes to a head. <laughs> 